Okay, so in this short lecture, we are going to be going over the post-arrest cath, uh, the who, what, when, where, and why. Kind of not going to hit all those, but we'll get into more, most of them. But first, let's go over some cases. So it's a normal night at the Tepper University Hospital Emergency Department when you hear a haste that a patient's coming in through triage one. So the patient arrives. Per the family, the patient had been complaining of chest pain all day and just collapsed. The patient has been unresponsive ever since. So you get the patient back into the resuscitation bay and you put him on a cardiac monitor and you see this. You feel for pulses, the patient is pulseless. So you begin resuscitation and you resuscitate the patient using high quality uninterrupted CPR you do all of the life-saving maneuvers for which you have been trained for your emergency medicine residency. You defibrillate the patient. And after all of this, you get pulses back. You now have return of spontaneous circulation. You have good cardiac activity on the ultrasound. However, the patient is still not awake. Well, what do we do next? We get a blood pressure and we get an EKG. And what does the EKG show? Well, certainly not good. It's wide complex QRS, but there are not obvious ST elevations. So what does this mean? What do we do with this EKG? Well, we find that this patient from the family did have some history of heart problems. They've been complaining of chest pain and they collapsed at home. So a cardiac event is certainly high in our differential diagnosis. However, there's not an obvious ST elevation MI from this EKG. So you call the interventional cardiologist. You have a discussion with them in which you discuss whether this patient needs to go for immediate coronary angiography. So that brings us to our question for today. Is this a patient that would benefit from going immediately to the cath lab? Okay. So you did your job. You did what ER docs do. You brought someone back from the dead. The question is, now what? Now what do you do with them? We're going to talk some about that. So in the old days, there wasn't a lot of recommendations um, in terms of sort of the coronaries of a post-arrest per post person. Um, there are only some specific areas where you could really get into some um, advanced management. Let's go over that. So in the 2013 AHA guidelines, there were class one recommendations, strong recommendations for a post-arrest patient who shows STEMI on their EKG that they should go and get PCI. You have a newly not dead person and they have a STEMI you should get them over to the cath lab. And they have 1A recommendations for that. But what about the non-STEMI patients? What about your not this, not Widowmaker person? What do you do with them? Well, that has kind of been a bit of a head scratcher up until now. So we have a shiny new algorithm, brand spanking new. Uh, it came out this month, July 2015. It's uh, by this guy, Rab, and others uh, in JAC. See? And again, just this month, just a little while ago, they had a update for some of this topic. And here it is. Well, bam. This is their new algorithm out of their paper. So they specifically are talking about how to manage the post-arrest patient who doesn't immediately wake up, doesn't start, you know, talking to you and say, thank you, doctor, you saved my life. And this is the majority of patients right there. Usually is a pretty significant neuro deficit or a comatose state uh, shortly after an arrest. So let's go into this a little bit. So you have an out-of-hospital arrest. Somebody comes back. You bring them back at their pulses. You take them from dead to not dead, but they remain comatose. That's kind of their inclusion criteria, if you will. And they say within 10 minutes of arrival or within 10 minutes of ROSC, you want to get your EKG and you want to start targeted temperature management. 
with the mild hypothermia as you've seen in the uh, recent changes on recommendations there. And if that EKG shows ST segment elevation, then you go down the orange side of the pathway and it pretty much kind of puts you towards PCI. They want you to consider the same risk benefit, high risk, low risk that we're going to go into in a second. But as we saw earlier, the AHA even in 2013 was saying if they have a STEMI and have been brought back, have ROSC, there's a pretty good chance that a PCI will benefit them. We'll go over this black area, gray area in the middle in a second. So what if their EKG does not show STEMI? Then they want you to institute to ACT, the A-C-T. So they want you to assess for the unfavorable resuscitation features. They want you to consult with your cardiologist and your ICU folks upstairs and collectively work towards possibly transporting the patient to the cardiac catheterization la uh, laboratory. If a patient is deemed suitable, then they stay in the blue here and they get one of these. You know, you want to see what their uh, coronaries are. They're getting early angiography. Look at what the coronaries look like. If there is a lesion, identify it and give them some PCI. Okay, so what about the unfavorable predictors for these patients? This kind of black area in the middle, both groups, you're supposed to consider it but there's a stronger recommendation for it for the end STEMI patients. Let's go over these predictors. So the unfavorable outcomes they mention. If it was an unwitnessed arrest, that has been shown through various studies and various compilations of studies that that portends a poorer prognosis uh, neurologically and collectively for a good recovery for a patient. So that is an unfavorable outcome. If it is not ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia, a lot of the literature shows that there's a, a much greater benefit to PCI in patients that have VTAC and VFib. If there was not a history for early bystander CPR, if someone's not on the chest right away, that portends a poor prognosis. You're not perfusing your coronaries or your brain matter uh, for a period of time until your first responders get there. And then if, if it was a long time, if there was a greater than 30 minutes for either starting of CPR or to obtainment of ROSC, if the person was down and out for a while. And sort of fitting with that, not exactly, but correlated probably would be if someone had a bad acidosis, if their pH is less than 7.2 after they come back or they have a lactate greater than 7. That portends bad prognosis and probably in the same way the greater than 30 minute downtime does. If they're old, that's pretty straightforward. If they're old, they have a poorer prognosis. They don't survive such a significant event as well as a young spry person does. If they have end-stage renal disease, that's an interesting one, a specific end organ dysfunction that has been shown to portend a poor prognosis. And finally, if it wasn't from the heart, right? If you have some other cause of your cardiac arrest, PCI may not be the route you want to send this person. That one makes sense. All right, so a little bit of the numbers, a little bit of the breakdown for these recommendations. Right from the horse's mouth, this AHA guideline, I highlighted the words that I want you to look at because I know these listeners I'm talking to probably don't read no good, so I'll read it for you. One-fourth of patients without STEMI have an acute occlusion, and nearly 60% of them have significant obstructive disease when you look at them under catheterization and planning for PCI. So what they're seeing is that even if you don't have an ST segment elevation on your EKG, you take these patients into the cath lab and take a look at their coronaries, this is what they're finding. A quarter of them will have an acute occlusion, likely a thrombosis that blocks something off, and nearly 60% of them will have a significant obstruction that's blocking the flow down to the, to the ventricles. So what about some of the patient, you know, patient outcomes? Where is this information coming from to make recommendations that are going to affect our patients in our ER? So this is the study. This is kind of the, the study, um, the one study to rule them all, if you will. It's Hollenbach and his group in resuscitation 2013. 
And they said their title, early cardiac cath associated with improved survival in comatose survivors without STEMI. So what did this group do? So again, it was in Resus 2013. It was a retrospective observation study of uh, 754 patients, all comatose arrest patients who got ROSC. And they saw that 269 or 36% of these were ventricular arrhythmias, VTAC or VFib patients that did not have STEMI. It's important to note in that they are not looking at patients with PEA or asystole who are brought back. Okay, so of these, 45% got an early cath, and the early cath patients had a better survival to hospital discharge, 66% versus the late cath group, which was about 50%. But compared to the no cath group, the patients that got catheterized early on did much, much better. They had, again, that 66% survival to hospital discharge, which is a pretty good number all in all for cardiac arrest patients versus a 29%, near 30% patients who did not go to the cath lab at all. So they found that catheterization, particularly early catheterization, portend a better outcome for the patients. Early cath patients had significant reduction in death with a NOS ratio of 0.3. Okay, quickly here on the bottom, a little bit of a shout out to the Reynolds article. Uh, just to show that this, you know, that Hollenbeck is, isn't coming out of left field, there is some background information here. Go quickly over this Reynolds article. It's a retrospective assessment of kind of who got cathed, basically. They found that um, catheterization in general and early cath was associated with better, better outcomes for their patients. Um, they did not specify or stratify by comatose state or not, or by STEMI left bundle branch or not. So that's why this is not really conclusive and this Hollenbeck article is the major one to main, make the recommendation changes. But uh, Reynolds as a whole, they found that catheterization groups collectively did much better and this and a few other articles was sort of the momentum and the uh, push behind getting this study done by Hollenbeck. Okay, so back to the cases. Now the question becomes, in looking at this new algorithm that came out by AHA, what are you going to do with these folks that we reviewed? Where are you going to have them go? Who's going to get to the cath lab? who's going to have a benefit from the cath lab. It's your decision, your patient. Think it over. Thanks for listening.